hey everyone, this lesson is on high magnesium levels or hypermagnesemia. In this lesson, we're gonna talk about where magnesium comes from. We'll also talk about causes of hypermagnesemia. We'll also talk about signs and symptoms and how we treat hypermagnesemia. So magnesium is an element acquired from our diets. There are many different dietary options we can employ in order to get enough magnesium from our diet. Some of these include nuts and seeds like pumpkin seeds or almonds, fruits like bananas, vegetables like broccoli, and we can also get it from brown rice as well. The recommended daily intake of magnesium is anywhere from 300 to 400 milligrams per day. And magnesium is required for many physiological processes. Many times it is required as a cofactor for an enzyme and there's actually around 300 enzymes that require magnesium as a cofactor. It's also important and required for hormone release. And it's also important in cardiac functioning and cardiac electrophysiology. And it's also required for the synthesis of DNA, RNA, and proteins. And for energy production as well. Most of our magnesium in our bodies is stored in the bones. And approximately two-thirds or 66% of our magnesium is in our bones. The remainder is intracellular with only about 1% being extracellular. So only 1% of it is actually measured when we look at a blood level. Magnesium is absorbed in the intestines and it is excreted through urination. This is how our magnesium levels are maintained. So kidneys play an incredibly crucial role in maintaining a tight blood level of magnesium. So the normal magnesium serum level is anywhere from 1.8 to 2.5 milligrams per deciliter. This can change depending on your location or what other sources you look at. Sometimes sources say 1.7 to 2.2, but for this lesson, we'll look at it as if it is 1.8 to 2.5 milligrams per deciliter. Anything below 1.8 would be considered hypomagnesemia. Hypo meaning low or below. Magnesi meaning magnesium. And emia is a condition of the blood. Low magnesium in the blood. That's what hypomagnesemia means. And anything above 2.5 milligrams per deciliter is hypermagnesemia. So hyper meaning high or above, and then magnesemia being the same. So hypermagnesemia is a high magnesium level in the blood. So this is the topic of this lesson. Now there are a variety of causes of hypermagnesemia. We're going to break them down into a variety of categories. The first category is increased intake or increased absorption. So we talked about some of those dietary sources we get magnesium from, like seeds and fruits and vegetables. So if you have lots of intake of that, it could lead to a transient hypermagnesemia. But really where we see it is in using an excess amounts of laxatives. So laxatives can contain magnesium and this can lead to large loads of magnesium. You can also see it from antacid use as well. So using excess amount of antacids can also lead to a hypermagnesemia. So we can also see it in ingestion of Epsom salts. So Epsom salts essentially are just magnesium salts. So if you were to actually ingest those salts, you're just essentially ingesting a bunch of magnesium. So that can lead to a large intake of magnesium leading to hypermagnesemia. And certain enemas, so magnesium enemas can actually lead to large absorption of magnesium in the large intestine. So we can also see it in iatrogenic cases. So being in hospital, if a patient is getting magnesium sulfate or parenteral infusion of magnesium, they can get hypermagnesemia. We can see this in cases like preeclampsia when we want to give the mom magnesium sulfate. This can lead to a hypermagnesemia. Certain gastrointestinal or GI diseases can also lead to hypermagnesemia. These include gastritis and colitis. So Gastritis and colitis can actually increase absorption or dumping of magnesium into the blood through absorption through the gastrointestinal system. The second main category of causes of hypermagnesemia is cellular shifts. Cellular shifts can include rhabdomyolysis. So rhabdomyolysis is necrosis or damage to muscles. This can occur from crush injuries. So the muscles and the muscle cells break down, releasing lots of electrolytes. And one of those includes magnesium. So magnesium can be dumped out of muscle cells into the blood. This can lead to hypermagnesemia. 
You can also see it in early stage burns, again, for the same reason. So cells are dumping lots of magnesium into the blood. You can also see it in tumor lysis syndrome. So tumor lysis syndrome is when we have lots of cells and usually it's due to a tumor. But most of the time when we talk about tumor lysis syndrome, it is a hematological cancer like leukemia. So there's lots of white blood cells. When we give those patients chemotherapy, those white blood cells break down and there's so many of them that it can actually release lots and lots of magnesium into the serum. And this is why we get hypermagnesemia. You can also see hypermagnesemia from cellular shifts in conditions of acidosis. Severe extracellular fluid deficits can lead to a hypermagnesemium reading when we actually look at magnesium levels. This is essentially because the magnesium becomes very, very concentrated in the serum. The third main category of causes of hypermagnesemia is reduced excretion. So I told you this before that the kidney plays a crucial role in regulating magnesium levels. If we're not able to excrete it properly, if there's reduced excretion, this can lead to hypermagnesemia. The big one here is chronic kidney disease. So a kidney disease leading to decreased glomerular filtration rate or decreased excretion of magnesium is going to lead to hypermagnesemia. The fourth main category of causes is metabolic conditions. These include adrenal insufficiency like Addison's disease. We can see this in primary hyperparathyroidism as well and diabetic ketoacidosis. Again, this is an acidotic condition. So similar to what we were talking about here with regards to cellular shifts. You can also see hypermagnesemia in hypothyroidism, so a low functioning thyroid. We can also see it in Helix syndrome. If you wanna learn more about that, please look it up. And we can also see it in the inherited condition known as familial hypocalciuria hypercalcemia. So this condition has a reduced urinary excretion of calcium leading to elevated levels of calcium in the blood. Some medications can also lead to hypermagnesemia or high magnesium levels. These include lithium. So patients on lithium for perhaps bipolar disorder can have high levels of magnesium, can get this from antacids. So we talked about this before. Excess antacid use can lead to hypermagnesemia. You can think of things like milk of magnesia as essentially is magnesium. So you're consuming magnesium, raising your magnesium levels. And you can also see it with theophylline. So usually it's excess theophylline consumption can lead to hypermagnesemia. So theophylline is often used in conditions like chronic obstructive pulmonary disease or COPD. What are some of the clinical features of hypermagnesemia? Most of the time it's asymptomatic, especially if hypermagnesemia is mild. Again, this is majority of patients. So we're going to break it down into what systems of the body are affected. And we'll also talk about at what levels of magnesium do we actually see these symptoms occurring. So the first system we'll look at is the neuromuscular system. Most commonly, we see neuromuscular symptoms occurring with hypermagnesemia. So what happens is if we were to take a look at two neurons, and you can think of this as the synaptic cleft, although Synaptic cleft is very close. I'm just using this as a representation. So here's one neuron, here's the other. So this is the presynaptic neuron, postsynaptic neuron. So this presynaptic neuron would release neurotransmitters and the signal will be picked up by the dendrites of the postsynaptic neuron. But what happens is in hypermagnesemia, high, high levels of magnesium ion prevent this signal from occurring. So high levels of magnesium prevent the proper signaling from the presynaptic neuron to the postsynaptic neuron. So this inhibits what happens here. So that's why we start to see neuromuscular symptoms. Some of these include deep tendon hyporeflexia. So if we were to take a reflex hammer and tap on the patellar tendon to see the patellar reflex, that would actually be blunted or attenuated. We can also see facial paresthesia. So Parts of an individual's face may feel a bit numb or have a tingling sensation. We can also see muscle weakness, and that makes sense. If we are inhibiting neural activity through this process here, we're going to have weakness in our muscles. We're not going to be able to use our muscles as well as we should. And if this gets so bad, it can actually lead to a flaccid paralysis. So if magnesium levels are so high and there's so much in the synaptic cleft preventing this transmission from occurring, we can get 
flaccid paralysis, we can actually get quadriplegia. And if it keeps going, can lead to respiratory depression and respiratory failure and eventual death because of this. Having very, very high levels of magnesium can be very, very dangerous and can even be fatal if we don't correct it. The other system I'm gonna talk about here is the cardiovascular system. The cardiovascular system can be affected by hypermagnesemia as well. It can lead to hypotension, so higher magnesium levels can lower your blood pressure. You can also see bradycardia, so a decreased heart rate. This is because of heart block. So the magnesium is preventing electrical signaling between cardiomyocytes. This can lead to heart block. And if this gets so bad, it can actually lead to cardiac arrest, again, being fatal. So when we look at an electrocardiogram of a patient with hypermagnesemia, there are certain abnormalities. And actually, these abnormalities look a lot like the abnormalities we find in hyperkalemia. So some of these include an increased PR interval, widened QRS complex, and elevated T waves or peaking T waves. So we can see here a prolonged PR interval, widened QRS, and then this elevated or peaked T wave. So we can see this with hypermagnesemia, but we can also see this with hyperkalemia as well. There are other electrolyte disturbances that can also occur as well. These include hypokalemia and hypocalcemia. And there are other symptoms, including nausea and vomiting and flushing. So I'm now going to talk about when these symptoms occur based on the blood level of magnesium. So as I mentioned before, the normal range is 1.8 to 2.5. So the first set of symptoms we start to see occurs with magnesium levels higher than five, so five to seven. So quite elevated compared to our normal range. So magnesium five to seven milligrams per deciliter can start to cause the patient to have nausea and vomiting and a headache and have some lethargy. So they start feeling a little bit tired. And this is when we start to see the deep tendon hyporeflexia. As the magnesium levels climb above seven or seven to 12 milligrams per deciliter in that range, we lose our deep tendon reflexes entirely. There is absent deep tendon reflexes. The patient goes from lethargy, so they're tired, to actually being asleep. So they get very, very fatigued. This is when we start to see hypotension or low blood pressure and the low heart rate. And this is when we also start to see those ECG abnormalities and some of the other electrolyte disturbances like hypocalcemia. When magnesium goes above 12 milligrams per deciliter, very, very, very high levels of magnesium, this is when we start to see flaccid paralysis, the quadriplegia. We can then start to see respiratory depression and failure. So there's so much magnesium ion in the synaptic cleft, we don't have that proper synaptic transmission. This is when we can also see complete heart block and cardiac arrest. And usually patients that do die with hypermagnesemia die due to the respiratory depression or failure. The respiratory depression and failure tends to occur before the cardiac arrest occurs. So this is usually the process. We start to see respiratory depression and failure before the cardiac arrest, but cardiac arrest could technically happen before this occurs. So how do we treat this condition? Firstly, we have to stop giving them magnesium. Stop any exogenous magnesium that might be leading to the hypermagnesemia. We then want to give the patients IV fluids and diuretics. So IV saline and give them Lasix. In patients with renal failure, where they're not able to excrete the magnesium, we need to dialyze them, hemodialysis for these patients. And because of all those ECG changes in the cardiac issues, Related to the hypermagnesemia, we want to give them IV calcium gluconate for cardio protection. So again, treatment of hypermagnesemia oftentimes is just stopping the exogenous magnesium. Give them IV fluids and diuretics. If they are a chronic kidney disease patient, dialyze them, hemodialysis. And then for cardio protection, give them IV calcium gluconate. So if you want to learn more about other medical conditions, please check out my channel. And if you found this video helpful and informative, please give it a thumbs up and consider subscribing to the channel. Any and all of your support is greatly appreciated. And as always, continue to live, laugh, and learn. And I hope to see you next time.